Good afternoon, readers. I wanted to come here and acquaint you with my tale and its protagonist, Andrea. I think that the best way to do that is to read the chapter that most pertains to the title, Gray Fox Connection. As the scene opens, Andrea is alone in her camp in the wilderness. A grandma, but now a fugitive, Andy is disconnected from everything, everyone meaningful in her life. It's February in the Southern Oregon coastal mountains and it's cold. Here begins the reading. One night, I heard a distant screaming, like a critter being tortured. I knew that sound from home, a cougar's cry. I shivered, grabbed a burgundy blanket, and went back to sleep. The next night, a second tortured sound accompanied the cougar scream, a kind of howling yelp. Cougar getting its dinner, nothing I could do. Moments later, another scream right outside my camp stirred me to action. It sounded like the cougar was just outside my windbreak. Cougars do attack humans, you know, Elaine Aluminum reminded me. Get it out of here. Elaine Aluminum is a camp coffee pot. Fire seemed the best defense, so I threw my headband flashlight on, lit my candle with shaky hand, and rushed from the tent, yelling and shouting. I heard a snarl awfully close by. I had saved a pitchy branch by the fire, and I grabbed it now, burned one end in the fire pit coals to set it af aflame, then ran around the perimeter of the camp, waving the flaming branch and screaming. I saw the cougar, or maybe shadows, sliding away in the trees. Making more noisy circuits, I evoked a chubby white image of an ancient aborigine dance. Dance with fire. My improvised ritual ended with the spraying of bear repellent around the perimeter of the campsite. I didn't know if it worked for cougars, but it couldn't hurt. Using most of my dry wood, I got the fire blazing. All was quiet except for my heart pounding in my ears. At least, I wasn't cold. I sat by the fire. Time passed. I heard no more from the mountain lion though I kept imagining rustling in the shadows by the woodpile. I started drowsing and went back to bed. Morning came, quiet and cold and clear, with my usual insistent bladder. I made maximum noise going to the latrine in case I still had kitty company. I filled the coffee pot and went to the woodpile to replenish the stack I'd used last night. Movement, not my imagination. My gasp made the critter hidden amidst the branches try to jump up, but it only managed a repeat of the twitch that first caught my attention. Oh, poor baby. I saw a petite dog-like nose and scared eyes. Was it a fox, coyote? I moved a few pieces of wood to reveal a little creature, its fur matted with blood. You're the dinner the cougar was after last night. No wonder he came so close. You're pretty courageous darting in here with a human and fire. My voice sounded odd. I realized I hadn't used it for weeks. The fire had been mostly coals when the critter came into my camp, I remembered. Critter surely was frantic to get someplace where the cougar 
wouldn't go. Probably my fire dance terrified it, but it had no options. And probably the dance saved its life. Murder in camp, glad we skipped that drama. The critter was panting, loss of blood, it needed water. I went in search of a bowl. I flapped in circles for a while, like a killdeer trying to lead a dog away from her nest. All that blood panicked me. I stopped, breathed deeply, and concentrated on calm. It would take easy, slow movements for Critter to believe I wouldn't harm it. Okay, water first. I talked aloud deliberately now, almost singing, trying to soothe. No bowl. I don't want to give you my pot. How could I sanitize it enough to use again? Find a piece of old wood to hollow out for you? No, you look miserable. You need water soon. And how can you drink when you're flat on your side like that? I poked a hole in an empty foil bag with my knife and went to Little Brook for fresh water. But the water came gushing out. The hole was too big. A second try was no better. Oh, Lordy, I thought, can I ever help this little guy? A needle, not a knife. Zipper bag? I filled it with water, then poked the hole and got a nice small stream when I pushed it. To calm Critter, I'd been babbling or singing math songs. My voice getting warmed up sounded less like a door on a rusty hinge as I returned to the woodpile. Hey, kiddo, it's Dr. Andy with part one of the cure. Take it easy now. I want to drip water on your nose. I don't think that's a smile. Easy now, I'll move slowly. But wait, before I approached with water, I needed to move wood away from Critter to open up the space. One slow branch at a time, I got enough of an opening. He made growling noises and thrashed, but he had no place to go and was too weak to even roll onto his belly. I hung a towel across his entryway and gave him a minute to feel hidden again. As I draped the towel, Critter looked up at me with liquid, slightly bulging brown eyes above dark, wet crescents. Critter's name changed to Sly right then. I'd need hot water later, so while Sly acclimated to his rearranged den, I cut wood into shorter lengths and stirred up the fire, talking or singing the whole time. Finally, I returned with the water bag, slowly moved the towel away, and eased down to the ground, arm's length from Sly. He wouldn't like my standing over him any better than my students at school did. Sly, it's okay. You need this water. I leaned on my left side and slowly moved my right arm over Sly and squeezed. His startled reflex when water hit his nose was a snarl and a lick. He didn't jump much. He still seemed unable to move. But the snarl and lick had marvelous effect. I squeezed more and he licked, tentatively at first, and then eagerly. The snarl faded and died. Hoorah, McGraw, for all the vet supplies I found at home and nearly killed myself toting here. Didn't plan on you, Sly. They were in case I got hurt. But I'm going to do my best for you. What a sweet-looking, undoubtedly vicious little animal. The first thing is to clean you up, Sly. I saw a lot of blood. This was going to be tricky. I could end up mangled, too. Voice low, I inched more branches away. My initial impressions were confirmed. Sly was a fox with a beautiful bushy tail, gray coat, and a terrible wound along his left side. A small stake appeared to hang off his shoulder, a piece of Sly. A slash along his rig ribs sagged open. I could see white cartilage or tendons or bone in spots on both his shoulder and his ribs. Whoa, Sly, this is bad. 
I'm sure his eyes would have broadcast, you're telling me, except they were full of a hundred iterations of, what are you going to do to me? Do humans eat foxes? Blood and torn flesh make me go wobbly and faint-headed when it's Sabrina, anybody for that matter, but I do better with animals. Experience helps, and after decades with dogs, cats, chickens, goats, and horses, experience was something I had in abundance. I'm no doctor, I told Sly. Will this shoulder muscle even function? You need four good legs to survive here. Infection, another problem. Boy, that cougar missed your belly by an inch. You'd have been an ex-fox for sure, old fella. I hope your other side isn't this bad. I don't know about your chances, but maybe they're better with me than without me. In that hole, his wounds were still hard to reach, and I didn't care to be trapped if he started acting like, well, like a wild animal. So I'd need to move him. I managed to push a, hard, a towel under him from behind, then tugged it and him closer to the fire. His teeth flashed. He was no wounded puppy. I had betadine, an antiseptic wash, often used by vets, just a little because it's heavy. Thought I'd need this slime. I poured some into a zipper bag and added warm water, leaving the bag open by a centimeter. With an injured horse, you start a wash near his nose so he can smell that it's not his own blood he feels pouring across his body. But horses are prey, foxes are hunters, so I didn't know if the thought process would be similar. Okay, fella, I hope you understand what I'm doing. I flooded the wounds, moving from his nose across his shoulder and along his flank, talking to him all the while. His back feet propelled him at least a foot. I was amazed he had seemed incapable of movement. But then he collapsed again, perhaps calmer, perhaps just resigned. I did a second wash the same way. It was when I was trying to pat him dry with the other towel that he got me. The transformation from passive surrender to ferocious attack was instantaneous and astounding. Needle-sharp teeth dug deep into my left hand. If my earlier crooning had any beneficial effect, I undid it now with my yelp. How damn, jeez Louise! I jumped up and hunched over, holding my left arm. Gripping tight against the hurt, I sagged back to the ground and leaned on the firewood pile. I'm such a wimp, pain makes me woozy. Sly, I can't afford this. What if it gets infected? Dang, you hurt me, fella. No blood dripped from between my fingers. I stole a look. Two short but deep gashes, one on my wrist, one just above it on my left arm. My self-treatment matched Sly's, flushing with antiseptic and patting, patting dry. Betadine doesn't hurt, I'm glad to know, Sly. I'd say you bit me out of fear, not pain. I smeared bag bomb onto my sliced arm, bandaged it, then appraised the situation. You're dangerous. I do get it. What if you get me again? What if I get infected? Get a fever, pass out. Who will fix me? We glared at each other across the fire pit. But I can't just leave you. You're such a little thing, a youngster, I bet. I gave him more water, dripping it as before from a bag well out of tooth range. I decided to muzzle Sly using a strip of flannel. The trick would be getting it on him. I'd learned a relevant bit of physics when geese chased me in my youth. An animal cannot bite you as long as you have a firm grip on the back of its head. With a goose, it's easy. One hand around the upper part of the neck does it. I'd try a similar trick to muzzle my little 
fox. Holding a strip of flannel between my teeth, I approached him from behind, grabbed a handful of loose flesh at the back of his neck, and pinned his head to the ground. He sure didn't think I was a friend at that point. His back feet kicked as he tried to push himself away, and his nails dug grooves in the dirt. He snapped and snarled, and I just hung on. Finally, holding his head still with my right hand, I wrapped a loop of flannel around his nose with my left. As his back end spun and struggled, I held him pretty brutally. One end of the flannel strip was between my teeth as I pulled it tight around his nose. I made a second wrap, tied a single knot under his chin, and pulled the ends of the flannel strip behind his ears, securing the muzzle with a slip knot there. The struggle had been terrible for him. Blood oozed again from his wound. Oozing, I suspected, because not enough blood was left in his body to spurt. Hours passed as I did what I could for the little gray fox. I needed a razor to cut away fur to tape him together, but I had to make do with tiny bad scissors from my manicure kit. After I cut what I could and rinsed and dried his wounds again, I pulled the hole on his shoulder closed and taped across it with in three places. After slathering on bag balm, I laid gauze over the wound. I treated the gash on the ribs the same way. He lay breathing fast, eyes closed, probably hoping the end would be swift. To help hold the cl wounds closed, I created a sort of flannel harness over the gauze around his ribs and across his chest, sewing it together where the chest band, where the chest band met the belly band. Glad I saved that piece of sheet. Glad I saved that piece of sheet and brought the sewing kit. Sure never thought I'd use it this way. I wrapped him round and round with pet wrap, a sort of sticky version of an ace bandage, another vet supplies item I thought I might need for myself. Maybe everything will hold together long enough to heal, Sly. He was still limp, his breathing fast and shallow. Finally, I dragged him to his hidey hole. He must have felt safe or he was just exhausted. Anyhow, he didn't struggle at all when I removed his restraints and replaced the towel cover over his space. By the time I'd cleaned up, it was mid-afternoon. I made a package of hiker stew for myself and set aside another for Sly. Then I refilled his water bag and went to see how he was doing. He wasn't doing well. This is, again, from the book Gray Fox Connection. I'm Barbara K. Freeman. After you have now met Andrea, you probably understand that it was really very much out of character when she blew up those three Mormon temples, which is what caused her to be a fugitive out there in the wilderness in the first place. I hope you enjoy my book. It's on Kindle and on Amazon. Thanks.